Mary. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Very good. Welcome to this interview. I am so delighted that I can uh, ask another artist some questions. Oh, and super. It's, it's um, interesting because I do believe that um, artists, although they spend a lot of time in silence creating, uh, do really enjoy talking about artwork. I personally think that uh, the only thing I love better than talking about artwork is actually doing it. Oh. So, <laughs> so let me uh, begin by asking you some interesting questions and please okay. take as, as much time as you want on these and you can move the answers any direction you want. Okay. But one of the things I would like to start with is to ask you um, as an artist, what is your what what is what do you feel your greatest accomplishment as an artist? I will tell you that um, I only create art to draw people to the heart of Jesus. That was like the impetus of me ever starting to paint was to try to really give um, the heart of Jesus to people. I believe that beauty and truth and God is very connected, right? So, um, you know, when I've prayed about different things that I've created, what comes to me from the Lord is that what's most important are that the images are like imprinted on the heart of the people who see them, right? So it doesn't really matter if they keep it <laughs> or if they like buy it now, right? You know, I've, I've for 20 some years made stuff and just given it away to people, right? What's important is that like ultimately our hearts are united with God and I would want my art to draw people to God. So I would say the greatest accomplishment that I can have is when I have somebody say, you know, Mary, I am so struck by that image and they comprehend what I had experienced in my heart in painting it without me telling them, right? They'll, they'll draw things out because then it means that the Holy Spirit is the artist <laughs> and not me. Um, and that he's working, you know, it's a living work because the Holy Spirit is constantly guiding me. I've never had an art class and I was laughing with my dad today because I thought, oh goodness, here, you're going to interview me. And if you asked me how I started, I would say, I went to Walmart to buy $1 acrylic paints because I lived on donations. And then I went in his basement and found scrap wood from an old factory that he um, used to own. And it was all rejected and cracked. And, you know, I took it upstairs and I prayed really hard and I made a bunch of stuff that people loved, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Everything that I do is from the Holy Spirit. And so I've learned to really pray as I paint, and I never know what I'm going to paint. Um, like I'll know like this morning, where is she? I did the Queen of Queenship of Mary. I wanted really to do an icon of Our Lady as Queen. And I had no idea what it was gonna look like. But I just pray and I start to let God guide my hands. And then it's almost like the Holy Spirit says, try this color. And I, you know, in my mind, I'm fighting and saying, you know, it's too dark. And he's like, Mary, trust me, try it. Like, you know, and like, it's a work together. And in the end, there's something and I'm struck and drawn into prayer as if I wasn't the artist. Like I have to study what we did then. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is my greatest accomplishment is when other people look at something I've made and their heart kind of skips a beat that way. And they almost forget the image and are drawn into prayer or drawn into union with God who is greater than that image. It was just like a means, a tool to draw them to him. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that is my That's answer. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I often think about the that that we in our our culture have a too limited definition of what prayer is. Yes. And 
I think you're on the same uh, kind of uh, uh, perception that I am that that actually creating artwork is yes. a form of prayer. Yes. I often yes. think that um, you can pray while you do artwork, but that could almost be interpreted as praying on top of praying. I like right. to think that anyway. <laughs> right, but, right. So do you have, out of the uh, idea of um, moving other people, do you have, can you describe to the audience, the viewers or the listeners, um, one specific moment with one specific per, uh, person that might stand out in your mind? What stands out greatest in my mind is children. And they always teach me the most, but I come from a family, there's 13 children and we took in foster babies and stuff. And then I have 70, I have to go back and count, I think 73 nieces and nephews, <laughs> wow. but um, they all live around here and they all visit Aunt Mary and are very taken by my um, vocation. And art is that. And so, you know, when they walk in my bedroom and they look at an image of Jesus and they understand something about his love, you know, um, that's what strikes me. I'll tell you, last night, um, I went and had to babysit for my sister. One of my nieces was being confirmed and she did, she's got nine kids. She didn't want the little ones going. And so I had a bunch of her little ones and um, seven-year-old Andrew, in fact, he told me to bring his picture and show it today and I forgot it. But he had seen something that I had shown him last time I was there and he decided to go and to paint. And it wasn't identical to what I had done, but it was that same spirit. And it was when he looked at something of Jesus crucified I had done. And then he said, well, Aunt Mary, I drew Jesus crucified and you can barely see his body on the cross. And, you know, I put the thieves there because they were really evil, but there was a water spill in the corner. So I turned it into the sun because his wounds are resurrected. And I thought he got it. He had looked at a piece of art of mine because I always like to portray Jesus as truly crucified, but with hope, you know, and mm -hmm. it struck him. And he spent hours, my sister said, painting lots of things, but the one he showed me was really beautiful. And he's like, you're going to have to help me with my art, you know? And then I showed part of what I had done with this queen of our lady to my niece that was there. And I don't know, Grace, how old she is, nine. <laughs> and she immediately said, will you bring me over and teach me how to do art your way? So to me, like, and it's prayer, it's all prayer. And I always teach them that you have to shut your eyes and ask God to give you an image and to guide your, you know, hand and it's not going to look just like what mine looks like, but that's okay. When I see somebody, like you said, it's a prayer inspired to pray that same way that to me is an accomplishment like that to me is profound um because it's not only like when i've had them say can i take this home and hang it in my bedroom but then they take it a step further and say i want to you know kind of communicate with god through painting mm -hmm. um and so uh yeah interesting very interesting if children always get it the best which my paintings are very simplistic but that's where i think you allow you know holy spirit can work through that yeah i oft, oftentimes think about how children are so creative they want to make things all the time and a right. lot of people um a lot of people lose that as they get older and I think it, it, it diminishes off when they um, maybe get 12, 13, and, uh, and that, that's unfortunate. And it's nice to, to try to foster and develop that, that creative uh, uh, ability within children and keep it going. Um, one other question. The next question is, as an artist, what is your greatest regret? <laughs> not buying better materials <laughs> but I never had money I was a missionary I had nothing 
And I took today, I had a regret. Which one was it? This one. So I went, I have a hermitage behind my parents' house. And when I was a hermit for three years, I've got like a six foot live <laughs> crucifix. And um, I would just go, it's like six feet by 10 feet. And that's where I would pray when I wasn't in adoration. And I had some of these art pieces there and I thought I should grab them. And I went and I took this one off the wall, which is one of my favorites because um, the twin fiats, and there's so much the Lord has taught to me about our lady's fiat and then Jesus's fiat on the cross to the will of the father and how it was one. And then my fiat every day, kind of entering into that. And so I painted him crucified and our lady underneath and me as a child in her hands, kind of receiving that grace, you know, and that blood and water coming from his heart to her heart, but kind of hitting me. But when I got here tonight, I looked and like I told you, my materials are very simple and I don't know what happened on his heart and right by me, but, um, I wonder if this painting's gonna last. <laughs> I thought I'm gonna have to try to touch up the color and put another seal on it. It never fell, so it must just be age. Um, what is what is the material you work in? Is that um, acrylic usually? Yeah, um, acrylic because um, I make a lot of mistakes, and I um, usually will do acrylic and then I'll take oil and to bring the color out at the end and put a little bit of oil on the top. On and top of the acrylic, yeah. Right, and then I'll let that dry and seal it. So like the brightest ones I have are that, and I love oil, but I'm not good enough. Like I make mistakes, so I like the acrylic because it dries and you can reform. Oh, yeah. and, you know, it's more, it's movable. Yeah, um, and it's also quicker. It's also like speed painting as opposed yeah, to some I, other yeah. process. <laughs> I had to paint my icon in one day. I had one day off of work. <laughs> you know? Let me, it's like, okay. let, me uh, let me ask, let's uh, keep going with some questions here. I want to know what your favorite artist is. And I want you to tell us why that person is your favorite artist, just quickly. Right. I don't know. Um, I will just tell you that when I see a picture and it's living to me, um, and it's uh, usually has to be of a spiritual nature to move my heart. I love it. The style can vary, but I will say that I am very, very drawn to, um, Eastern Orthodox iconography. And I don't know, I don't even know enough about art. Is that, um, is there one artist that started that style and then everyone follows it? I don't know. But mm -hmm. um, I was very drawn. I spent some years in Russia doing missionary work. I, my heart is very Eastern in that way. And, um, you know, icons like that, traditional icons very much move my heart. Mm. Um, What's your background? When did your ancestors, where did they come from? Yeah. And when did, they, when did they come to America? America. I'm 100% Polish. And I did find out that my grandpa's family was from Augustov, which is on the border of Russia. So there might be some of that in my heritage. My great grandpa, Kazimierz Peszakowski, when he was 14, came over from um, Poland and I met him. He lived to be 106. So wow. I'm, when I was really little still, I think I was, you know, five or six when he died. Um, and he was a furniture builder. And um, then, I don't know, with my dad's side, that was my mom's side. I don't know when my dad's side came, but it was um, not my grandparents, my great grandparents that came. And they all spoke Polish. And then like my grandparents were taught Polish, but they wouldn't teach my parents because they wanted them American. And exactly. That's Russia. how it was back then. I know. It's so sad. Sebastian was just telling me about his Lebanese relatives were the same. But when um, I ended up in Russia working with the Polish missionaries, they said, you're not 100% Polish if you don't know Polish. So I had to learn Polish along with Russian. <laughs> oh, my but, goodness. And then I passed their test. Um, what? Let me, let me ask you another question that comes to mind right now. Uh-huh. Um, what artwork, I asked you what artwork you like. Right. Now, 
now I want to ask you what artwork you hate. Oh, modernism that doesn't look like anything. <laughs> I like beauty. I love your artwork. It looks like like Michelangelo, -y, you know, when uh, <laughs> I cannot stand a metal bar put in the middle of a park with a sign that it's artwork. And I believe artwork can be symbolic, but um, I love beauty. And so like true beauty reflects God and God reflected himself in creation. So saying that, you know, a metal bar is a flower, like compared to somebody who actually recreates a flower, you know, I just don't think there's a comparison. So yeah. I absolutely cannot stand, I, I hope I don't offend somebody, but like that super modernistic and then anything super dark, but I'm sensitive spiritually. Um, I don't like, um, anything that is borderline dark. Um, mm -hmm. it yeah. just bothers me. <laughs> Why do you think that artwork is so popular in, uh, mainstream culture today? I'm talking the very, uh, non-representational artwork. Do you have any idea or have you thought about why, right. why that artwork is filling a lot of the the contemporary maybe, public galleries? Yeah, maybe because, you know, my sister and I were talking yesterday about the lukewarmness of people in general. And um, it, you can kind of see it in like our artwork. Like, you know, like people aren't like on fire for like truths and um, yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that all of life is kind of like lackadaisical and wishy-washy and relativistic. And so like artwork can just be like anything. Um, I think in some degree, it's a spiritual battle because mm -hmm. like I told you, truth, beauty, and God are very connected. And in Russia, I saw that, you know, in those cities where communism took over, everything is a gray slab. There's no beauty. It is so depressing. Yeah. Even the architecture, like, everything you could go through poland and you would know which buildings were built when the communists took over at the snap of a finger you could just call it out but in the villages where the babushkas had held the faith the the little houses were decorated with this beautiful art and you know the, it was like god was protected truth was protected and beauty was protected and mm -hmm. um you know a lot of times those that had been exposed to communism told me that they felt like they didn't have a heart. Mm -hmm. And they said, Mary, I don't understand, you know, when you talk about the human heart, because I think and I can feel that there's nothing deep inside of me. Well, you would be more okay with modern art that doesn't really show much profound, you know, if that's where you feel like you are interiorly. But if you right. have a, you know, a passionate um, understanding of the human heart, then you're gonna really appreciate, you know, beautiful, yeah. beautiful art. So um, what you're saying is that your heart is actually something you could lose if it's not uh, basically put in a culture that, uh, right. or if it's in a- it Maybe not lose, that's right. The book I wrote about Russia is a heart frozen in the wilderness. What I learned right. is when I loved these people, and I expose them to truth. I expose them to beauty. I expose them to joy. They would say, why are you so happy? And um, I was like, because I'm an American? I don't know. <laughs> it would wake them up. And yeah. then we would be attracted and they'd come. And it was incredible. I mean, even now I'm still friends with them and they contact me and they love my stuff. But at first, I remember here, that was in 2001 to 2003 where I continually lived there. You know, they were very different people. Um, and I think they didn't lose their heart. I think it's frozen sometimes in, in today's culture, you know? And, you know, I go in somebody else's apartment and there's like nothing but a black box. And um, they come in mine, which is like a garden of art. And they say, oh my gosh, I love this. Yeah. It's not that they don't, you know, and they have something totally different. I think they just don't know it. it hasn't been awoken within them. 
you know? Interesting, interesting. Could you describe a typical day of your life? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. I mean, right now, I have lived so differently. Because for 20 years, I lived as, um, well, uh, for 12 years, I lived as a missionary all over the world. So everywhere I was was different. Did you do artwork then? Yes, as I traveled. And in fact, the first 30 pieces that I did, I gave to a priest in Poland, and I asked him to keep it for me. And after a few months, he wrote me, he goes, Mary, I burnt those pieces. And I said, Padre, he goes, well, I don't think it's the most important in your spiritual life. And I was like, you didn't ask permission. Yeah. But I have pictures of them. But I mean, it doesn't matter in the whole scheme of life. But so I would travel and yeah, and I would do things. And then when I became a hermit, um, I would spend nine, 10 hours a day in prayer but this, like my joy is prayer, number one, that life with Jesus. And then like expressing it and doing it in music. So like I write songs and being able to do that. Guitar is the only instrument I play. Um, but I do it the way I do art. Like I never have taken a lesson. It's all the Holy Spirit. And then um, like painting and like, um, you know, it's meditative. These, I have a couple of these, my nieces took some of them, but I did a series. These are all Carmelites. But I went and I printed out the best quotes of each one of the Carmelites. And then I, I you know, mod podge, you know, superimposed them on top of the faces that I drew, drew of each one. So like, you know, it's meditating on the Carmelite spirituality as you're doing it, you know, and you're going through and you're finding it and then you're trying to represent it. So as a hermit, I would, you know, it all kind of blended together. When was I praying and when was I painting and when was I singing? It was all together. Then um, my, I ran out of money. I lived on divine providence for 20 years and Jesus gave me everything and I just had nothing. So I thought being a nanny, I can, children I can take care of with my eyes shut and it's kind of contemplative if you especially stay with the littler ones. Um, you know, it's just a very simple life and I can pray and take care of them. And then it's like living right now, several vocations because I have to work 40 to 50 hours a week with these children. So I get up at like four and I pray for several hours because I still have a hermit heart and I need like at least five or six hours of prayer a day. <laughs> and then I go to work and then I go to mass and I come home and then I try to work on my writing of these books or art. Like yesterday I got the day off. So on my cupboard, I laid out three icons that have been in my heart for months and I finished two. The third's gonna have to wait, but it's a little more complicated. And um, you know, last week it was kind of the same thing. Like in the evening I was like, oh, I have a podcast tomorrow. I don't have a song. And it had to do with my book on womanhood and this door is um, something that I painted on Jesus with women. So I thought I should write a song about that. So, you know, in the evening, I'm like throwing together a song and all of this. And I don't get to bed. I sleep very little. Um, <laughs> I sleep three or four hours at night right now. But um, it's because I, um, I can't financially sacrifice work, but I'm not willing to sacrifice prayer and the Holy Spirit is so powerfully giving me things, I don't ever want to say no to him. And I would have lost this image if I did not stay up till one in the morning working on it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but like my sister needed a babysitter. So I went and when it was important, when she came home that I stayed for a little bit, like holiness is in today, the way I treat you in front of me, regardless if you are a two-year-old or you are Timothy the artist, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, um, I tried to really give everybody that attention. And so I didn't get home till 11 and then I had to finish working on it. So, you know, my days are different. And then I try to throw exercise in there sometimes. Um, when you, when you do your artwork, what is there a uh, usual, uh, minimum amount of time you spend on it? It always it... keeps me longer than I plan. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, several hours, I would say, for an icon. I can do an icon in several hours, but I almost always during that need to leave, pray about it, 
and the Lord will tell me to go back and change something like add oh, this cool. or yeah. put this on, you know? And so I don't rush it because like last night when I left to go babysit, I thought there's something I don't like about her veil or her thing. And, and so I prayed about it as I was driving over there and he clearly told me, you know, add flowers here and this will lighten it up and it'll, you know, and so I came back and I added and changed. And then I was like, Whoa, that works. So mm -hmm. I always have to step away. And if I'm not sure about something, I will put it aside because I would rather wait on the Lord than do something myself. You know? So I would be fair in assuming that you would have maybe two or three uh, paintings on the go at any given time? Yeah, but sometimes I'll go weeks at a time without painting, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What, what's the longest that it ever took you to finish a painting? <laughs> I've got angels sitting at my parents for two years <laughs> okay. that I never went back to, but I want to. Excellent. But I would say like... In, like one piece that I'm continually working on was the door. And yeah. I, it was a year, I was living in Chicago. So when I would come home and visit on the weekends, I'd work on it, but I kept it in my dad's garage and I liked to do it on the driveway when it was sunny because the light is so important to me. Yeah. Um, and I love Polish pottery. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it kind of looks like my door. <laughs> there's yeah, traditional yeah. Polish pottery and there's so much detail in it. And so I would go slowly and it was like, you know, do two flowers there and two flowers there. So it's symmetrical. So I would do it. And then a slash there and a slash there. Now go away and pray about it. You know, now do something here and do something there. And, um, I thought I knew what these were supposed to be, but I wasn't positive until the end. So this took quite some time and it was just random. I thought one day I should paint a door and then my sister-in-law's mother found one at a garage sale and I was like, okay. And they said, what are you gonna do with it then? And I said, I have no idea because I don't have a house to put a door on. <laughs> so <laughs> it just sits in the corner here, but I love it. <laughs> Is there any um, time that you ever did a non-religious uh, re uh, art piece? Um, or when I was 16, I remember once doing African orphans. I don't even mm. know where that is. I remember doing, I've always, you know, orphans have always been on my heart. And so I remember um, painting African orphans, but I don't know where that is. Um, mm -hmm. But usually... Like, I'm not an artist to be an artist. I'm an artist to pray and express something that Jesus has put in my heart. So usually it is spiritual. Um, this, I mean, this is a Siberian winter scene, but it's a little chapel in the woods that are very, you can find these little shrines all over Siberia. Mm -hmm. So it's not particularly, um, you know, only like a saint or Jesus, but it's, um, our lady is in there, but and a little bit more hiddenly. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking, I mean, I think I'm pretty much Jesus, yeah. Mary. So <laughs> one, other, one other question. Um, if you could recommend one uh, Christian book to the viewers that really impacted you. Can you think of something that you could uh, tell the, the viewers um, that is a must read if they have the time? Is there Besides any- Besides the Bible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like eat the Bible alive. I will say, like in general, you mean? Yeah, is there any is there any Christian book other than the Bible that you, that has moved you, whether the it be your art? Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body, but that's not easy. It yeah. powerfully imp impacted me, and I have it in Polish and English. Oh, and really? It, yeah, it impacted the book that I just published, and that is kind of a conglomeration. Um, Edith Stein, you see Edith Stein, her writing has powerfully impacted me. Um, her writing on women, but more her writing on the cross, um, her writing about John of the Cross, St. John of the Cross, Therese of Lisieux. I'm very Carmelite in that. Um, do you do poetry yourself? 
I have, in Notre Dame, I took a poetry class. I loved it. Um, yeah. And so sometimes it comes out like poetry. Um, I mean, actually, the bookcase is across from me right now. I'm like, you know, what else is up? Um, Archbishop Luis Martinez in Mexico was the spiritual director of Blessed Conchita, who started, she was married, but she started several religious orders, and she was a victim soul, and um, I like her writing, but I really like her spiritual director, Archbishop Luis Martinez, um, and he's on his way to be canonized as well, and like, Spiritually, Padre Pio is very close to me, but all I have from him are his letters to a spiritual director. That's more yeah. like snippets of things, but he very much connects with my heart. Who's your favorite saint? I don't, Mary. When I was like five, I wrote a whole essay in kindergarten <laughs> on how Our Lady is my favorite saint. And you have to say that in Joseph, right? But I would say, you know, Padre Pio, Therese of Lisieux, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Edith Stein, uh, I mean, I, I love them all, though. I mean, mm -hmm. I love them all. Martin de Porres, Rose of Lima. I love them all. I could go on and well, on and on. <laughs> let me ask you this. How many years have you been doing artwork? And oh, can you tell me, uh -huh. have you noticed a change in yeah. how you approach it? Um, I'm not really concerned whether if I looked at one of your early works, if I would notice a difference, um, but could I? And, um, yeah. but more importantly, what, how has it changed? How long have you been doing this and, and how has it changed? Right, I would say when I was like 16, um, I did a couple icons and um, they were more impressionistic, like Dottie, you know, like Monet kind of an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't paint. And actually, when I was in Siberia, I went to confession one weekend, and the priest gave me a penance of painting an icon. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm in Siberia. Like, where am I going to find paint? He's like, oh, Mary, there's a paint store. And that is actually what got me going. Yeah. And um, those early on paintings, yes, they were not as good. Well, um, well, tell me why they weren't as good. What? Tell me why they were not as good. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. And I think that was it. I think you do learn and become better when you do something over time. Um, but I will tell you a couple icons have um, sold on my artist shop and they were actually the early ones that I wouldn't have chosen. So I like, who am I to judge that, right? Yeah. I was like, yeah. you bought that? Okay, <laughs> you know? um, and I would say that I, you know, I think even in my spiritual life, I have noticed deep, more and more details about the heart of God. And so I add those to my paintings. You know, it's like, um, and you, as you grow to know somebody better, then, you know, all of those details you know, make it up. And so, you know, if you ask me about Mary 30 years ago, she was Mary. But if you ask me about her now, what I could tell you about, you know, her sorrows and her purity and her intercession and her union with the priesthood and like all of this, and that all plays into my art. So um, there are always details in it that, um, grow with like my interior knowledge of the subject which is usually spiritual you know mm -hmm. sometimes i go back to simple um but uh yeah i think that's why it's changed um but my, i would say my approach i knew when i started that eastern um christian catholics or eastern orthodox when they paint icons they fast and they light a candle and they pray and it's like a whole thing. And I always approach it that way. I still light a blessed candle when I paint, like oh, great. Yeah. for the point of the matter, um, you know? And um, if I forget to fast, God makes sure something happens where I'm like, oh, I offer that up for this one. <laughs> because it's not just about the work, then it's for every person who will ever see this, that will ever encounter it. And now that I have, 
I've come to a point where I'm actually letting people see and buy it maybe because I never did, you know, before it's tucked away in my bedroom or given to a niece that puts it in her bedroom. Now I have these images out and people actually see them. The opportunity for them to touch their hearts is more and I'm glad I prayed and fasted so much when I did it because maybe something I did 15 years ago will touch you in a way that I, I don't know your life history. I don't know anything, but the Holy Spirit's going to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so my approach has always stayed the same with that, like that prayer way. Um, yes. But, um, let me ask you, what is the thing that you have a problem with, with the Catholic church? Is there anything now no. that you think um, about that kind of pisses you off about the Catholic Luke Church. Warmness. Right now. Luke warmness. <laughs> you know, or when you have people who say one thing and do another, or people who say that they're Catholic and they're willing to murder babies. You don't murder babies. Like, period, end of story. So it's, you know, the church is the body of Christ and in what it is in the catechism, I have no problem with. That is the teaching of Jesus Christ. And I um, breathe that. It fills me with joy. Um, the people in the church who um, especially are hypocritical um, is saddening to me. Or if you meet, you can meet priests sometimes that are so lukewarm and like I'll go with this image of Jesus crucified in my heart to mass and they're talking about the coronavirus and they're like feed me you know talk about the gospel or something um so that's frustrating sometimes because there's so many riches that the church has for people um you know if you're catholic be catholic like be who you are be that saint God created you to be. Um, and so it really frustrates me when I see people not living according to Jesus. I'll tell you, I remember being like seven or eight in church <laughs> and I listened to a gospel and I don't remember which gospel it was, but I turned to my parents and I said, those are really the words of Jesus and they said, yes, Mary, you know, those are really Jesus's words. And I said, why doesn't anybody do that? <laughs> and it bothered me as a child. I saw that contradiction, you know, mm -hmm. to me, you live the gospel without compromise. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. What do you think um, in the next, uh, at this coming election, I want your prediction about the election coming up. I hate politics. Be holy. <laughs> what would you like me to project? I don't know. I know that all that matters. If you look at all the issues, any society that murders babies is evil. So I would say you need to vote for the people who protect the most vulnerable being infants in the womb of their mother. And mm -hmm. children who are trafficked are pretty much equal, uh, is a fire in my heart. Like abused, mm -hmm. I worked with abused children for years. I've worked yeah. with victims of all of this. Um, so all I would say is that when you die someday and you look at Jesus Christ in his eyes, he will ask you what you did to protect babies. And you'll have to answer for it. And nothing else matters. I've lived, for example, in Mexico on the border in the trash dumps where the people are really poor. I totally understand why they're sneaking across the border. Like, I totally get it. I've been down there. I would do it if I was a mom down there trying to save my children. But is immigration issues as important as the murder of a child in the womb of his mother? Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's hard to, you, nothing matters more than protecting the life of the most innocent. So to me, like when I look at that, I, you know, I thought, well, God, you know, at least President Trump has been very strongly pro-life. 
Um, now, when I think about somebody else being elected and the number of babies that are going to be murdered, I'm panicked. Today in the post office, I heard them saying things that I was like, people really think like that? Like, to me, it's just obvious. So, um, I don't know. That's kind of where I am. Did I lose you? No, no you're fine. Can you hear me? <laughs> now I can. <laughs> Yeah, that's an, that's a very interesting uh, point. And you know, the uh, I as a Christian sculptor, I do um, public and secular pieces as well. Right. And there was, I think it was around 15 years ago. I wanted. I'm German in background, and I wanted uh -huh. to do some uh, sculptures that celebrated German culture. So right. I did some research on pre-Christian German culture. And uh, pre-Christian, it took me, after getting three books, it took me all of around uh, 20 minutes uh, reading to come to the horrible conclusion that um, they believed in human sacrifice, uh, child, child sacrifice. Yeah. And the fascinating thing is I thought, oh, okay, I knew that. The, uh, the aboriginals, the, the, the Native Americans were into that. I know right. that many other cultures were into human uh, sacrifice, but the Germans, yep. Right, I, I didn't know the Germans were too. Yep, and, and the interesting thing is, that is one of the things that Christianity crushed around the world. Good. And what I find <laughs> fascinating is, is our, when our culture becomes more secular it's coming back just right. in a different just in a different style you you could say and that's i al always believe that that and i always think that it's been lost in our our society that that our morality that we hold is universal yes but its roots are in christianity and right. if we and if we we forget where the roots came from um, we will, we're in jeopardy of losing our morality. And because, I and, and I, that's what I see in the world today with, with the issue of abortion, um, right. where, it's, where, it's, where it's kind of mainstream culture. Oh my um, gosh, it makes me so angry. It's, it's it fascinating. So angry. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. But this is what the early Christians um, fought. This is, this is right. what they were fighting when they went to my my ancestors up in Germany and all over the world, they were stopping violence for the sake of violence. The Germans also believe that um, you'll go to heaven or Valhalla if you die in battle. Well, that's that's a great way to, to encourage peace around the world, isn't it? Right. <laughs> but people, people um, forget about Christianity that it is our morality today. It's the thing right. that brought our morality, including the, the idea that slavery is not good, right? right. It wasn't right. the ancient Romans, it wasn't the Greeks, it wasn't the aboriginals, it wasn't the Africans, it was the Christians, right? Right. And so it's, it's fascinating. But moving on here, that's, that's very interesting. But moving on, um, I think we're kind of running out of time, but let me ask you an important question here. Okay. What, how, would you see ideally yourself in 10 years from now? Oh, back as a hermit. <laughs> and then if I could have my vocation back where I could live, I had to write a rule. When I had the three years under a bishop, you have to write a rule. I love my rule. Um, and it had a set schedule. And I believe it was very strongly from Jesus Christ. I would love to live that. And then part of that has time for work every day. And that work could be art. It could be music. It could even be podcasting because you, what you need is silence and solitude, but it, it doesn't have to be absolute alone in the Sahara. You know, there's different ways to live as a hermit and, um, it, it, you have hours every day for that. And um, that would make me really happy. And like my nieces and nephews could visit me. It's not like you don't have relationships. I did a lot of spiritual direction and I love helping souls find God. 
Um, it's not that I don't love my nanny job. Like I love children and it's awesome. And, but I, I would lose children if I could have my primary vocation back as a hermit. Um, How does your art fit in with that? My heart is very much that, very much that. No, I said, how does your art, how would your oh. art fit in with your ideal routine? How does my uh, um, art fit? I can yeah. do it every day. I mean, I could just add to little paintings here and there. I could, you know, there's a hermitage down in South Texas where um, I would stay and they have a bunch of, you know, uh, most of them are adobe buildings, but some are like sheds people put up. But it's like a Lara where people would come and there were a lot of different hermitages. And there was an iconographer and an older lady from France that would come and paint. And one of them has her icons all over it. Oh, how I would love to pray and to like take over one of these ugly buildings and make it beautiful, <laughs> you know? Or mm -hmm. like if I wasn't renting an apartment and I could actually paint the icons on, you know, to create something like that, I think would be beautiful um i i love to take ugly things and make them beautiful um, is there is there a dream project for your artwork that that you've been thinking about um that like uh, what i'm thinking of is in the ideal world in 10 years from now uh -huh. would your artwork be different or is it just more or what do you think do you think um I don't know. ask yeah. jesus <laughs> <laughs> i would love to have a, a shrine of crucified love where jesus would have where it would be like a chapel where people would come like a retreat center or something and the side altars could have my icons and the crucifix in the front would be a great bloody crucifix. And, but the tabernacle would be the center and something like that where it's more living than just a picture. Um, yeah. But as I've prayed about that, what the Lord has said is I need people's hearts to be shrines of crucified love in this world. And that, like I said, I want it imprinted on them and for that to affect them first. That's more important. Um, I think I think what would be absolutely amazing is walking into a chapel mm -hmm. and seeing from the floor to the ceiling, everything just totally filled with your artwork, your painting. Like that door <laughs> there. <laughs> could you imagine walking into a chapel and just like right. your door is opaque with beautiful patterns, colors. Right. Man, you got to find someone to give you a chapel oh, and let you do a makeover. I've prayed for years. I mean, that's <laughs> what came, a shrine of crucified love. And so I've prayed about it and I thought, well, yeah. maybe when I die, somebody will make it. <laughs> that's that how it always happens, right? When that, you die, you get what you want. <laughs> that would be but a I funny... Would love it. Yeah, that would be an amazing project. And, you know, you could live in the chapel and right. actually right. work just like Michelangelo on his Sistine ceiling. Right. Just, I can see you there with your candle and right. doing an absolute landmark. Well, thank you so much. This has been a delight to chat with you. Thank and you. Uh, God bless you. And I wish you all the best with your artwork and, and keep you. on creating. It's beautiful. Uh, thank you. And pray for me, please, too. <laughs> I will. And your, your artwork is, is so inspiring and cheerful and happy. Oh, and, it, and it truly looks like a celebration of Christ. Thank oh, you so God. much. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.